Olá, gente. Um, Bem-vindos a todos no nosso novo seminário. Hoje temos Maurício Bustamante, que um, um, fiz, ele é originariamente da Peru, um, fiz o, o, a, a graduação na Pontifícia Universidade Católica do Peru, depois ele foi para a Alemanha, para o Würzburg, fiz um postdoc no Ohio State University, um, no mesmo lugar de Mike Lisa, para quem lembra do nosso de departamento. E depois um, fiz um postdoc em Copenhague e fui contratado como professor no Niels Bohr Institute. E ele um, está uh, pesquisando a intersecção entre física de partículas, e, entre física de partículas e astronomia e cosmologia. Ele vai falar disso, ele vai falar disso nesse seminário. Um, como sempre, por favor, um, como sempre, por, por favor, desligue o vídeo, desligue o áudio. Um, pode ser que se você não desliga, eu vou desligar para vocês, um, porque um, às vezes atrapalha a conexão. Depois do seminário vai ter perguntas, se você tem uma pergunta urgente, por favor, me escreva no chat, é, me escreva no chat, eu vou, é, eu vou, eu vou admitir sua pergunta. Um, and without further ado, um, Maurício. Thank you, thank you very much. And thanks and uh, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you everybody for being here. Let me share my screen now and then I'll start as, as, uh, as you heard if you have any questions please uh, don't hesitate to to ask don't wait till the end if it's an urgent one all right um, so uh, what is nature like uh, at its most fundamental level uh, what are its building blocks uh, how do they interact and uh, what are nature's underlying principles, if any. Uh, for the better part of the last century, we've given progressively deeper answers to these questions, which lie at the heart of physics and science and human curiosity in general. And uh, we've been successful. Uh, uh, our tools of the trade were and continue to be, and will continue to be in the foreseeable future, particle accelerators of progressively higher energy and luminosity, that reveal new particles and new interactions and new underlying symmetries. And we distilled all of that into the standard model. Uh, today, uh, these accelerators keep churning out valuable data and uh, will continue to do so. Uh, but so far, they have not provided us with uh, significant evidence for uh, extending our fundamental view of particle physics. Now, guidance to, to do that, to go beyond the standard model, may exist by observing processes at energies uh, that are higher than the ones we have access to with our accelerators, but we are limited by our technology. Um, fortunately, uh, nature itself provides a way forward, and it is to complement our own man-made accelerators by cosmic accelerator accelerators. And these are uh, violent astrophysical phenomena like a supernovae or supermassive black holes or uh, star mergers um, that are able to make particles with energies millions of times higher than the LHC. And uh, that includes charged particles, uh, protons and nuclei, which we see as cosmic rays, uh, gamma rays, and uh, particularly neutrinos. And uh, what I'm going to do today here is uh, try to convince you that uh, neutrinos are uh, in especially incisive probes of uh, particle physics at the higher energies and that uh, we can uh, do this already with data today um, in spite of, of several, I should say probably many things that we don't know yet about them and that the next decade will be uh, probably bringing us even more insights. Okay, so let me be uh, a bit more precise and I uh, give you a few reasons why uh, it is interesting to study fundamental physics with high-energy cosmic neutrinos. Um, the first one I've already alluded to 
these are the neutrinos of the highest energies we've seen so far. Uh, we've seen neutrinos up to PEV. Uh, in the same way that building a new accelerator at a higher energy opens up a potential new uh, realm of physics to test, uh, seeing these neutrinos for the first time at these energies also allows us to probe physics at new energy scales. And the second reason is that- uh, Mauricio? Go ahead. Uh, your slides haven't been advancing. I don't know if you've been advancing them or not, but we're on your oh. slide and it's not full screen either. Is that the case? Ah, good oh. point. Sorry okay. about Okay. Uh, I did not realize yeah, that. Right. Let me... It was a long introduction. I don't uh, want to sorry. correct until I knew for sure you were changing slides, but... Yeah, I was, I was. Uh, so let me let me stop sharing and share again and you see yeah. if you see that now. That happens Thanks up. for letting me know. Uh, maybe this is better. So let me see. Can you actually see this sliding now? We see slide one full screen. See it? Oh, yes. Uh, now we do, yeah. We now see we the LHC. Okay, cool. Yeah, Thank now you. it's moving. Okay, then uh, can you see this? Yes, it's the, it's the after. Okay. It's the okay. <laughs> this is the, the astrophysical source, right? Okay. Yeah, that that's, cool. yeah that's an app. That's okay, an app. good, good. Yeah, okay. Cool. Then, uh, then I was what okay. Let me let me let me recap a bit. Then uh, I was going to give you four reasons why uh, it is interesting, or I should say, uh, particularly interesting, to study fundamental physics with high energy costing neutrinos. And um, so, reason number one is that they reach the highest energies, as I said, which allows us to probe uh, physics with the new energy scales. Uh, reason number two is that they traverse the longest baselines. Uh, There's a cosmological scale baseline from the sources to us at the Earth, and by that I mean uh, distances of the order of gigaparsecs, and bear in mind that the observable universe has a size of a few gigaparsecs, so these neutrinos are essentially traversing the size of the observable universe. That means that even if we're looking for tiny effects in an individual basis, um, these effects can compound and become observable by the time the neutrinos reach Earth, so that we have a chance of observing them. Um, so in a plot of uh, energy in the x-axis and uh, travel distance in the y-axis, our uh, usual suspects are uh, on the bottom left corner, so lower energies and lower travel distances that uh, include neutrinos, reactor neutrinos, and um, neutrinos with different uh, baseline short, long, and atmospheric neutrinos, solar neutrinos, and even supernova neutrinos. In the opposite end, at high energies and high travel distances, there are the high energy neutrinos that Isaac has seen, we'll say more about in a moment, and even higher energy neutrinos reaching energies above 10 to the 17 electron volts, which we haven't seen, but we hope to see in the next decade. So just to confirm, you're now looking at a slide with numbers one and two, right? I'm assuming, yeah. Yeah, yeah we've got the colorful pink okay. and orange. Okay, and thanks. Side. I wanted to be absolutely sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right, so the third reason why neutrinos are especially uh, incisive probes is that they are weakly interacting, uh, which is both a blessing and a curse. And it's a blessing because once they are produced uh, at uh, sources uh, located at cosmological distances, they bring to us information about those high energy processes that gave rise to the neutrinos. And that information is not going to be going to get biased or distorted by any interaction that the neutrino may undergo while propagating to Earth. Um, that means that if there is any deviation from the standard expectation that they won't interact, then that deviation may pop up uh, more easily and we might be able to detect it more easily. And it's a curse, of course, because neutrinos are difficult to detect just because of the same reason. Um, the fourth reason is that neutrinos have a unique quantum number, it's flavor. It turns out that flavor is especially powerful probe of neutrino physics and astrophysics. I'll say more about that later. And the uh, fifth reason, uh, which I'm calling always a practical reason, is that uh, testing neutrinos, testing fundamental physics with high energy cosmic neutrinos, in a way it comes for free, in the sense that most of the efforts so far um, dedicated uh, and to neutrino physics at these energies have gone to trying to find what the sources are, so the astrophysics side of things. Um, so we can just repurpose that data, uh, use in some cases the same tools, and do particle physics with it. Um, 
Now, the detector that has allowed us to make this progress is, as you probably know by now, is IceCube. IceCube has been running about for about eight years now. It is a cubic kilometer of, of uh, Antarctic ice uh, that instruments uh, uh, with uh, about 80 strings containing uh, about 5,000 photomultipliers. Uh, ice located at depth between uh, one and a half and two and a half kilometers in the South Pole. Um, and the, it is a light detector. So when a neutrino of energies between TEVs and PEVs that I detects uh, comes in, occasionally it will interact with a nucleon, uh, either a neutron or a proton, and uh, create a shower of, uh, of particles. And the charged particles within that shower will radiate current of radiation that propagates through the ice and gets picked up by the photomultipliers. So every time IceCube sees a dim flash of light, it is uh, most likely uh, a neutrino that interacted. Sometimes it is a cosmic ray, sometimes it's a muon. Um, out of uh, well, most of the events that IceCube sees uh, can be classified in two uh, types, depending on how, on the shape of the light profile. It can be either showers or tracks. And showers are made mostly by electron and tau neutrinos. Um, they occur when the neutrino uh, interacts with a nucleon and creates a particle shower that is localized around the interaction vertex. Uh, there's a, 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 the light propagates outwards from the interaction vertex, uh, more or less uh, radially. And so you get a, a approximately spherical uh, light profile, as you see here uh, on, the, on the left, on the bottom left. Uh, so it propagates outwards from the uh, central red dot. Each dot here represents one photomultiplier. And uh, at late times, it moves towards the green, um, depositing uh, less and less photons. Uh, on the other hand, there's tracks, and those are created by the charge current interaction of mu neutrinos. And in addition to the, to the shower created around the interaction vertex, there's a final state, high energy muon, that leaves the interaction region, travels for a few kilometers, and can be identified separately from the shower, uh, so that these events can be classified separately from tracks, from showers, sorry. So out of uh, showers and tracks, mostly, uh, ISCIP has found a host of results about astrophysical high energy neutrinos. And I'm gonna name a few which are key to what I'm gonna say later. The first one is that after about 80 years, it's uh, found uh, all, just over 100 events between energies of 15 TeV and 2 TeV. And those are contained events. So those are events where the neutrino interaction occurred inside the instrumented volume. There's tens of thousands of events where the interaction occurred outside, a muon track was created, and a segment of the track crossed the detector. Um, the sample of contained events is the most astrophysically clean one, the one that has the best energy resolution because you're depositing, the, in most cases, the full, uh, very large fraction of the neutrino energy inside the, the detector volume. And uh, so we'll mostly use that in what comes later. Um, the evidence in favor of there being an astrophysical neutrino flux between a few TeV and a few PeV is at more than seven sigma now. What you see here in the bottom left is a, a plot of the uh, flux of neutrinos plus antineutrinos multiplied by two powers of the energy as a function of neutrino energy. The black points are ice cube data points and they are fitted uh, fairly well with a power law. There's a uh, blue band with a one sigma uncertainty around it. Um, if you use instead the, the other data set that was alluding to, the ones where the neutrino interactions happen uh, outside, you get true going muon, then you get a, also a power law, and in this case, the purple one, and you, there's a small tension, but it's not really, between the two data sets, but it's not really significant. Um, next, uh, IceCube can also reconstruct the arrival direction for the, for the uh, events that they detect. Um, the resolution for showers is, is fairly bad. It's about 10 degrees. And the reason is it's, it's a mostly spherical light profile. So it doesn't point in any particular, particular direction. And it doesn't point to one particular incoming arrival direction of the neutrino. Whereas for tracks, because you have the muon, uh, which follows the direction of the initial neutrino that gave rise to it, then the resolution can be as good as a sub degree. So what you see in this sky map, is uh, the distribution of contained events in, in equatorial coordinates. So the northern hemisphere is above this curve. Um, the galactic center, if you see my cursor, is over here. And you see that the, the 
crosses, which represent the showers, have a worse angular resolution than the pluses, which represent the, uh, the uh, tracks. Um, so when you take into account the exposure of ice cube, which is uneven in the sky, turns out that the arrival direction distribution is compatible with the neutrinos being generated by uh, an isotropic distribution of sources in the sky, which points to an uh, uh, extragalactic origin for the neutrinos. Otherwise, you would have seen them uh, accumulated towards, for instance, the galactic plane or the galactic center, which we don't see. And uh, finally, I want to mention that ISCUP also measures the flavor composition. And by that, I mean the fraction of electron, muon, and tau neutrinos in the incoming flux. Um, and so far, it's compatible with there being an equal amount of each. And this will, be, uh, will become uh, relevant in the talk later. Uh, however, I want to say that measuring flavor is difficult. And the reason why that is so is because if you see a shower, a shower looks the same if it was made by a new or by a new tau. Uh, whereas if you see a track, you can be mostly sure that it was due to a new mu. Uh, sometimes new taus also make tracks. Uh, so it's, you have to find three flavor compositions, new mu, new mu, new tau, from two light topologies, shower and tracks. That is why measuring show, uh, flavor composition is difficult. Um, so I always, I always like to show uh, like a status quo of high energy cosmic neutrinos. So what we know now after eight years and what we don't know, uh, what we know is that the distribution of sources is isotropic. We don't know what the sources are, but most of them, but it's isotropic. Uh, the events can be fit well by a power law with some spectral index. There's some uncertainty about the spectral index. Uh, at least some of the sources are gamma ray transients. I won't talk about uh, the one or two point sources of high-energy neutrinos that have now been seen. I will talk mostly about the diffuse flux made by all the combination, all the combined sum, all the sum of, of neutrinos by all the sources distributed in redshift. Uh, there's so far no correlation between directions uh, of the cosmic rays and the neutrinos. Uh, there's uh, about, seems to be an equal number of new mu's, new mu's, and new taus in the diffuse flux. And so far, there's no evidence sign of new physics. And by that, I mean that new physics is not popping out at us, but jumping out at us yet. It doesn't mean that there is no new physics. Uh, what we don't know is, of course, what are the sources, the sources of the diffuse neutrino flux? Uh, what is the neutrino production mechanism? What is the exact value of the spectral index of the spectrum? Uh, how far in energy do the neutrino sources make neutrinos? Is there a cutoff at PV or do we go farther up? Uh, are there any Milky Way neutrino sources? Uh, what is the precise flavor composition? And most importantly for our purposes, is there new physics? And of course, we have clear expectations and there's fast experimental progress to answer all of these questions. So uh, eight years into this, and uh, I've shown you there's still some big uncertainties. And, and a question that I, I think is relevant to us and you might be thinking about is in the face of all these astrophysical unknowns, we don't know what the sources are, we don't know what the precise value of the spectrum is, et cetera. It is, it is, does it make sense to try to extract fundamental TV, TV neutrino physics? And my resounding answer is that yes, it does make sense. And not only that, but we can already do it today, uh, but it's hard and uh, there's no better way to show that uh, to a rookie uh, suffering from doing something that is actually worth doing. Um, so let me now go more in detail. Uh, this is a plot of the non-anthropogenic neutrino fluxes. Again, you see the flux in the y-axis multiplied by two powers of the neutrino energy as a function of neutrino energy. And uh, let's start from the left. Uh, at the lowest energies, so at about uh, media electron volts and less, there's the relic neutrino background, uh, which is abundant, but not yet detected on account of the very small energies that they have. Uh, further up between MeV and TeV, there's uh, all the, most of the neutrinos that we have seen so far, and these are abundant and detected, uh, at least most of them. Uh, in, in yellow, you see the solar neutrino fluxes. Um, in uh, dark green, you see the flux of neutrinos from the one supernova we've seen in neutrinos, 1987A. Uh, in, in softer green, there's the diffuse flux of all supernovae, which we haven't seen so far. Uh, we expect to see uh, soon with the upcoming detectors. And then from GeV energies up to TeV energies, there's the atmospheric neutrinos coming from cosmic ray interactions in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, we've seen those plenty. And starting from TeV and all the way to PeV energies, uh, those are the neutrinos that I should have seen. That's the those are the data points over here. Uh, down here, there's a, uh, a 
an upper limit on what the contribution from the galactic neutrino sources could be, by galactic I mean Milky Way neutrino sources could be. And at even higher energies between TeV and EV energies, so 10 to 15 and up in uh, electron volts, those are the cosmogenic neutrinos coming from ultra high energy plus degree interactions with a CMB, which we haven't seen uh, on account of that flux being very small, but we hope to see in the upcoming, uh, uh, in the next generation, next generation of neutrino detectors in the coming decade. Uh, so, where do these neutrinos that I could be seeing come from? Uh, let me just give you one uh, toy model explanation. Um, and this is my one astrophysics slide. Uh, so, uh, most astrophysical sources that may make neutrinos will also make uh, cosmic rays and, and gamma rays. And uh, we believe them to be sources like uh, galactic, galactic, galactic nuclei or uh, gamma ray bursts that are that um, hold a high enough magnetic field that can trap protons and slowly accelerate them by a collision of shocks uh, up to energies of 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 21 electron volts. And they will follow some energy, uh, some energy spectrum that goes more or less like the energy to the power of minus two, which is what you see there. Um, many of these sources are also bright in gamma rays. Uh, so we know that there's a photon target field there, and that is also modeled usually as a power law with some kink or some break uh, at MeV energies typically. Uh, so the protons and the photons interact about half of the time they do it by generating a, a delta resonance, uh, slightly higher in mass than a proton. And it's short-lived, so it decays promptly into a, either a proton and a, and a neutral pion or a neutron and a charged pion. And those decay in turn. So the pi zeros decay in gamma rays, which contribute to the gamma ray emission from these sources. The charged pions decay into neutrinos. Uh, in this particular case, you see that you get two mu neutrinos for each electron neutrino, and I'm summing neutrinos and antineutrinos because IceCube does not distinguish between them. They make the same light signal, so it's difficult to tell mu from mu bar in IceCube. And finally, the neutrons uh, are able to escape. They're not magnetically confined anymore. So they beta decay into protons uh, outside the sources. And those are the protons that we see as uh, cosmic rays at Earth with energies of 10 to 20 or so, like I said. Now, this is what people refer to when they talk about the multi-messenger connection. The neutrinos, uh, gamma rays, and cosmic rays are making the same network of processes. And not only that, but their energetics are linked. If we see a PEV, Neutrino, it means that if it was made by a process like a proton-photon interaction, the proton had an average energy 20 times higher. So you need sources that are able to accelerate protons up to 20 PeV or so. And of course, uh, I'm not mentioning the gravitational waves here, but that's actually the fourth element in this picture. All right, so now let's, let's start landing this towards, uh, high, uh, towards new physics. Uh, it turns out, uh, luckily, that numerous new physics effects have intensities that grow as uh, some power of the neutrino energy, so e to the power of n, I'll say more about it in a moment, uh, times the distance that the neutrino propagates from the sources to the Earth. And you see this kappa parameter there, that is just a coupling, generic coupling for a particular model. So, of course, the, the value of n, the, the and its dependence, depends on exactly what kind of effect we're looking at. I'm just giving three possibilities there. Uh, these are not the only possibilities. They're just representative. Uh, you can, if, if it goes as one over E, it, it's uh, representative of neutrino decay effects. If it's energy independent, it's some kind of Lorentz violation. If it's energy proportional to the energy, it's a different kind of Lorentz violation. So for us to be able to, uh, for us to be sensitive to effects uh, like these, then they have to be of the same order as the um, standard terms that control the propagation of the neutrinos in, in the propagation Hamiltonian. So we ex um, equate the standard oscillation Hamiltonian to this new uh, contribution. It turns out that we may gain sensitivity to very small values of the couplings and of the order of 10 to the minus 47 by seeing neutrinos of PV energies that travel distances of gigaparsecs or so. And that is a, a large improvement over uh, limits that have been set by using atmospheric neutrinos, which have lower energies. You see here that the atmospheric neutrinos placed 
limits of the order of 10 to the minus 29, 10 to the minus 20, 33, depending on, on the value of n. And with astrophysical high energy neutrinos, we can reach um, a couplings of 10 to the minus 47. So several orders of magnitude better. Uh, fundamental physics can be uh, extracted by the imprint that they leave in the four main neutrino observables, uh, the spectral shape of the neutrinos, their angular distribution, their flavor composition, and the arrival time. And all of this can be uh, examined in, in spite of our current poor energy angular flavor construction uncertainties, and of course, in spite of the physical unknowns. So before moving on and showing you a few specific examples, I want to give you a bird's eye view uh, uh, and a way to classify all the available uh, landscape of new physics models. And to do that, let's pick a few models, uh, some of which you might have uh, personally worked on and uh, or that you might recognize. Uh, so there, we can organize them along two axes. The first axis, uh, we can think about at what stage in the neutrino life uh, they affect the neutrinos. So some of them will act during the production, it means at the sources, at the astrophysical sources themselves. Others will act during the propagation from the sources to the Earth. And those are many of them. Remember that most of the power of using high energy cosmic neutrinos comes also from the fact that they travel long distances. Uh, and uh, yet other uh, models will affect neutrinos act detection. And by that I mean uh, once they reach Earth and interact with the nucleons on the Earth or in the detector itself. And the second axis along which we can organize uh, these models is uh, what observable they affect. So you see here going from the top left and clockwise, there's the four observables that I mentioned earlier, the energy spectrum, the distribution of arrival directions, the flavor composition, and the arrival times. For each one of them, we have a standard expectation. By that I mean an expectation when there is no extra uh, new physics. Um, for, the, for the energy spectrum, we expect a power law, as I said earlier. For the distribution of arrival directions, we expect some uh, isotropic distribution, uh, just because we, they're coming from extra electric sources that are, that are distributed isotropic in the sky. Uh, for the flavor composition, we expect them to be equally distributed in new in and new tiles. And for the arrival times, the best way to think about this is that we have a transient astrophysical source, for instance, a, a flaring blazer that is making neutrinos and gamma rays uh, at the same time and emitting them at the same time. They should also arrive at the Earth more or less at the same time. If we see a delay or a speed up of the neutrinos compared to the photons, that might be a, a sign of new physics. Um, so each one of these models may affect uh, each one of the observables or more than one at the same time. Uh, and one way to classify them then is to actually point at what they affect. So you see a pretty complicated and pretty rich picture of, the, of a representative part of the landscape of new physics. And this might be intimidating and I, uh, one way I, I like to think about this uh, is, is not as, as something evil, but actually as uh, everything we could have wished for uh, is, 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 is showing that there is a vast landscape uh, of physics that is up there for us to grab and to test. So I'm not going to explore each and every one of these models, but I'm going to show uh, four, uh, maybe probably three, uh, different possibilities of, of uh, how this is done uh, with actual data. Uh, let me start uh, by something that is uh, closer to something uh, more familiar, which is the measurement of neutrino cross-sections. Um, and for that, uh, you, some of you might recognize this plot from the particle data group. This is the neutrino nucleon cross-section uh, as a function of neutrino energy. The y-axis is the cross-section divided by the neutrino energy. And uh, all of these points come from accelerator experiments. Um, to the left, there is coherent neutrino scattering, um, which we measured recently. To the right, there were also no measurements until recently, uh, where IceCube could actually provide us the data to measure the cross-section at energies above 300 or so GeV. Um, so it's instructive to move from left to right and see how the cross-sections change. Uh, the lowest energies in this plot, quasi-elastic scattering is a dominant process. A uh, neutrino turns a neutron into a proton, and an anti-neutrino turns a proton into a nuclear neutron. Uh, that dominates up to about 1 GeV. Uh, above that, the neutrino has more energy and can excite a nucleon, which then de-excites and emits a pion. And that is dominating up to a few GeV, where deep inelastic scattering turns, takes over, and it will take over all the way up to the ice cube energies. And in this case, the neutrino is energetic enough that it can interact with uh, the particles of the nucleon, break the nucleon up, and create a final state 
uh, hydronic shower, uh, which I'm calling their X, and a final state, uh, either charged or neutral leptons. So uh, we didn't have measurements of the cross-section at energies above a few hundred GeV, but of course we knew how to um, predict that cross-section. So we know how to calculate neutrino uh, parton cross-sections, the I mean neutrino quark and neutrino gluon cross-sections, and we know fairly well how uh, partons move inside a nucleon by experiments like Hera or Zeus. So we can take these two ingredients and calculate, uh, and predict how the cross-section would look like at energies between TeV and above. What you see here is the neutrino nucleon cross-section, the charge current one in the y-axis, and this is average between neutrinos and antineutrinos because as I said, I still doesn't distinguish between, between the two of them as a function of neutrino energy. All the data points that I showed earlier are to the left of this plot at lower energies. And you see some, some markers on the top. This is uh, in the center of mass energy. You see left, the Tevatron, the LHC, where we are at more or less now, and the uh, future secret collider, if that were to actually happen. Uh, Ice cube might be able to measure neutrinos up to 100 PV pushing it. Probably it won't reach as high. Probably it will just reach 10 PV or so. Uh, but the parameter space that we can test now is marked, uh, let's say, up to 100 PV. And for neutrino cross-sections that are even higher in energy, uh, we need a, a different kind of flux, the cosmogenic neutrino flux that I mentioned earlier, which we haven't seen so far, and a different kind of, of detector, probably something bigger than Ice Cube. Um, but this is the interesting, the higher energy part is actually uh, the most interesting uh, parameter space because that's where the predictions start to deviate the most. All right, so how do we do this? Um, well, the, the best way to think about this is, is to think as Ice Cube, uh, as, to think of, of the Earth as a target, as Ice Cube as a detector. And uh, then we borrow a, a concept from our uh, astrophysicist friends, and this is the concept of optical depth. In this case, the optical depth of neutrino nuclear interactions. And that is simply um, the distance from the point where a neutrino enters uh, the Earth to where it hits Ice Cube. Um, divided by the mean free path to neutrino nuclear interactions inside the Earth. So this denominator, the mean free path, that depends on the neutrino energy. So the higher the energy, the higher the chances that it interacts with a, a nucleon inside the Earth. The density of the interior of the Earth, which we know uh, from seismic measurements, uh, and the, um, the direction, the trajectory of the neutrino. So if it, it's a very shallow neutrino, I will only cross the crust and where the densities are not very high. Uh, if it's actually very deep inside the Earth, it might cross the, the, the center of the Earth, which is denser and therefore the chances of it interacting are higher. So we call this the optical depth, we name it tau, and tau is directly proportional to the neutrino nucleon cross section. So now let's consider two scenarios. The scenario where, the, where we have neutrinos below 10 TeV and above 10 TeV. And, uh, it's assumed that we have an isotropic neutrino flux that reaches uh, the surface of the Earth. So below 10 TeV, the Earth is transparent to neutrinos independently of where they come from. So remember, Ice Cube is in the South Pole, so it's, it's down here. Uh, that means that um, below 10 TeV, we have neutrinos that come directly from above. Uh, those are called downgoing neutrinos, and they will not be stopped by the few kilometers of ice. Uh, between the surface and ice cube, and the from the opposite of the opposite side of the Earth, we have neutrinos that might traverse up to the diameter of the Earth, uh, more than 12,000 kilometers, and those will also not be stopped because at these energies, uh, the mean free path is pretty large. Uh, the situation is different at uh, Boston TeV because the energies make uh, the interaction more likely between neutrinos and nucleons. So the downgoing neutrinos still have an optical depth that is very small. Uh, they, are, they are unlikely to be stopped, whereas the neutrinos that come from the opposite side of the Earth, they are likely to be stopped because now the energies are high enough that the, the cross-section has grown, and then the optical depth is of order one. They are likely to interact. So whereas at low energies, the number of upgoing and downgoing neutrinos should be about the same, at high energies, the this same ratio should be uh, exponentially suppressed by the cross-section of neutrino nuclear interactions. And by then comparing upgoing to downgoing neutrinos, we can measure the cross section. And that is what we did. So we took, for this plot, we take one of the predictions of the cross sections and we calculate what this attenuation factor is inside the Earth. 
Uh, we plot it as a function of the positive energy. Well, I should say neutrino energy in the y-axis. You see the positive energy, but for the purposes of this plot, is the same as neutrino energy. And uh, the direction of the neutrino in terms of the cosine of the zenith angle in the x-axis. It goes from minus one to one. And to understand this, uh, remember, downgoing neutrinos are the ones that are coming directly from above. Uh, and that the zenith angle is measured at the south pole. If you look upwards from the south pole, that's zero in, in theta z. So cosine of the zenith angle is plus one. And on the opposite side is 180, which means cosine of, of 180 is minus one. So uh, all values of cosine, theta, cosine of theta c that are negative are upgoing, going through the earth. All values that are positive are downgoing, just going directly from above. Um, up here at high energies and, and large uh, baselines, the attenuation factor is the most intense. By that, I mean that is closer to zero. And uh, this is because the attenuation factor you should understand as a factor that multiplies the flux. So the smaller the attenuation factor, the higher the suppression of the flux. So high energies, long baselines, the higher the suppression. Um, it means that if the neutrinos are uh, of low energies or they traverse not a long baseline inside the Earth, then the Earth is transparent and the, op and the attenuation factor is about one. There's, not a modifi there's no modification of the flux. Um, on the opposite side, if the energies are high and the baselines are long, then the Earth is opaque and the attenuation factor is important, it's about zero. So now we overlay real events of six years of ice cube contained events uh, on top of this, and you see that at the lowest energies, the, uh, the upgoing and the downgoing neutrinos are in comparable numbers. At the highest energies, uh, the flux is low and there's no upgoing events. These have been stopped inside the Earth because the attenuation was too significant. But at the center, uh, at the hundreds of TeV, there's a Goldilocks region where you can make a comparison between the downgoing and the upgoing neutrinos. And uh, that's where we get the most out of the method that I was referring to. And then um, I won't talk about how exactly we build the likelihood that we take into account all of the, um, the background from atmospheric neutrinos and uh, we take into account the different paths, uh, the different densities depending on the path of neutrinos. And we extract then the cross section as a function of energy from that six year data set. And that's what you see in this plot. So again, this is the cross section of neutrinos plus and, uh, the average of neutrinos and, and the neutrinos as a function of neutrino energy. You see these four points over here, that's the, the cross sections that we extracted. The first three are actual measurements. The fourth one is at hyper limit. And um, it is compatible with the standard model prediction, which is the orange band over here. Uh, of course, the error bars are high because we're basing this in only about 60 events. Uh, 60 showers in the six year data sample. So we're limited by statistics. However, uh, it is, as I said, compatible with thermal expectations and it's also compatible with a different analysis made by IceCube using not contained events, but events that started outside the detector and, and, and traversed part of it, the through going muons, and that is the green band that you see over here. Um, so with more data in the future, if uh, next generation of IceCube gets built, we can actually improve uh, the measure made by reducing the statistical error in, in 40% uh, because we'll have uh, 300 showers in the same amount of time, six years. Uh, you should also bear in mind that uh, these uncertainties can actually be smaller at the higher energies. And I won't talk much about this. Uh, so, okay, so now let's, let's move to something completely different. Uh, so now you see how you can extract neutrino nucleon cross sections, which is fairly close to what we do typically uh, from, uh, in particle accelerators. But now let's measure, let's uh, move on to secret neutrino interactions. And I'll say what that means. Uh, so the big picture first is that we have astrophysical neutrino sources, the sources and, and, and the Earth. And they are separated by either kiloparsecs, if these happen to be galactic neutrino sources, of which we know not at these energies, or, extra, or megaparsec to geoparsec baselines, if these are extragalactic sources. And uh, in the standard case, neutrinos, once they're produced, just free stream and oscillate. And we'll say more about oscillation in a bit. Uh, but in the non-standard case, uh, we could have the high energy astrophysical neutrinos scatter uh, off the, uh, I'm missing an F here, or scatter off the cosmic neutrino background of uh, relic neutrinos of energies of 0.1 mini electron volts. Um, that can happen multiple times. Um, and each one of these interactions is called a secret neutrino interaction, which is just a fancy name for a beyond standard model neutrino self-interaction. 
So uh, what happens here is that one of the astrophysical neutrino and the relic neutrino scatter off, uh, scatter by uh, uh, exchanging a new mediator. In this case, you see a scalar phi. And each time that happens, you can affect the energy spectrum because the energy of the astro high energy astrophysical neutrino gets redistributed into the um, two final state daughter neutrinos. Um, is the coupling is flavor dependent, it will also affect the flavor composition of the flux. Uh, you see that at each time it interacts, it will change the trajectory a bit, so it also affects the direction, and it uh, and also it will attain, it will uh, affect the distribution of arrival times. It will delay the neutrino um, compared to a straight line path. So, um, one usually uh, these kind of interactions are modeled like uh, the cross section as a, the resonant cross section as a bright signal cross section with two free parameters: a new coupling constant g and new mediator mass m. Um, of course, there's a resonance, <coughs> so resonance energy which depends on uh, m, um, the powers of, of the mediator mass divided by twice the neutrino energy. So um, just to illustrate what the effect of the secret interactions is on the neutrino flux, you see on the plot um, the flux at Earth multiplied by two powers of the energy as a function of the neutrino energy. And the standard case is the dotted blue line. So if there's no secret interactions, uh, the sources emit the neutrinos and the neutrinos free stream. There's a higher energy cutoff. That's why you see an exponential dampening at the high energies. But then you turn on the secret interactions and let's forget for a moment that the about the reintroduction of the final state neutrinos, which is assume that neutrinos are lost. And that's, when you do that, you get a flux that looks like the dashed orange line. There's a dip right here around the resonance energy. In this case, for the parameters for this particular plot, that resonance energy is 500 TeV, so you see a dip. Uh, and now let's turn on the regeneration, and by that I say, I should say that the re-injection of the final state neutrinos. Remember, these final state neutrinos have lower energies because the astrophysical neutrino energy has been now split into the energy of the two final state uh, neutrinos. So there's a pileup uh, at energies below the dip. And that's, that's what you see, uh, this bump over here. And of course, this is for a particular choice of mass and coupling. Um, we don't know a priori what the mass and the coupling are. Uh, and that's what we want to find out. So and we're going to do that using ice cube data. Again, Let's, let's do that. So this is the same kind of plot, flux in the y-axis, neutrino energy in the x-axis. Uh, but now I'm showing three different cases uh, of three different masses of 4 MeV, uh, a bit more than 14 MeV, and 50 MeV. And I'm assuming that the neutrinos are being emitted by the sources with a power law, with a certain power law uh, index, in this case, 2.74. Uh, this is something that we also let vary in our, in our analysis. I'm just showing this for illustration. Um, so you see here that, of course, because the resonance energy changes for, uh, like, like two times the power, like I, uh, n squared, then uh, the higher the value of the mass, the higher the value at which the dip due to the resonance appears. And on the other hand, there I'm showing here two values of the coupling. For large values of the coupling of about 0.1, the dips are uh, white. Uh, for smaller values of g, the dips are uh, the dips are uh, narrower are more difficult to detect in principle and overlaid on top of that you see the six-year ice cube contained data set um, those are the blue points over here and i want you to focus on this particular one here which is not a measurement but rather a upper limit there is a gap in the event spectrum there's that uh, that will actually affect our results as i'll show in a moment um, okay so how do we do this um, is to show you a bit of, of how we take into account these uncertainties. As I said, we're going to look for these dips in the six years of uh, public ice cube data, which contain about 80 events between showers and tracks, distributed in 18 TeV and 2 PeV. Uh, for this particular analysis, we assume that the couplings uh, of, of the new mediator, the phi, are flavor diagonal and they're universal, so all flavors are affected with the same, by the same G. And we do a basin analysis where we vary the mass of the mediator, the coupling, and the shape of the emitted flux, uh, this gamma factor here. Uh, we also, of course, take into account atmospheric neutrino uncertainties, atmospheric immune uncertainties. We take into account the propagation of the neutrinos inside the Earth, which is different for different flavors, different for neutrinos and antineutrinos, and different depending on the direction of the neutrinos. And we account for detector uncertainties, especially in the um, energy resolution 
and, uh, and how the neutrino energy translates into an actual observed energy of an event. So we take all of that, the uh, Bayesian analysis, and unfortunately we find no evidence of, or no significant evidence of secret neutrino interactions in the form of dips in, in the data. So what you see here uh, is um, again, the, the, the ISP points, and they are fit by the ISP collaboration themselves. This is a blue band over here. It is just a simple power law fit to the data. This is the one sigma uncertainty. Overlaid on top of that is our own fit. The best, the best fit values give a, 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 a flux that looks like the solid green line, uh, and the one sigma uncertainty is the shaded area in green around that, which is perfectly compatible at the one sigma level uh, with the ice cube with IceCube's own fit. Um, now, I want you to notice the fact that uh, the, the location of the dip is, is close to the point where we have no events in the IceCube data set. So it is this gap in the events that is pulling the fit. It's making the, fit, the dip appear in such a way that it's explaining the absence of events. Um, so because we don't have a statistically significant evidence for secret neutrino interactions, we can place upper limits on the size of the coupling as a function of the neutrino mass. And uh, that is what you see here uh, in, in red. Uh, and of course, there's uh, different probes that have been used to look for secret interactions, including cosmological probes and supernovae and, and uh, the case of chaos in the case of, of uh, mesons. Um, and our own limits are compatible with all of them, but they are produced in a completely independent way. Uh, you see here uh, that we're limiting masses of the, uh, from about 1 MeV to roughly uh, 100 MeV, though the sensitivity degrades uh, significantly towards the higher masses. And also there's a small window here where it, the limits degrade significantly, and that is the region where the fit becomes better by trying to explain this, this uh, absence of events in the data. Um, also, I should say there's an X, there's an additional limit put with high energy astrophysical neutrinos, not with the diffuse flux like we did, but with the observation, uh, the first observation of a high energy neutrino source, this TXS 0506 plus 056, this is a flaring blazer. And um, by arguments that are similar to ours, uh, you can put limit, uh, such a limit like this one over here, this blue line. All right. So this is what I wanted to say about secret interactions. Let's move over to something, uh, again, completely different. I, I, as I said, I'm trying to give you a flavor of, uh, of the of parameter space. And, and, and just so happens that the next topic is actually flavor. Um, so again, let's give you the big picture. Um, again, we have astrophysical neutrino sources uh, that, that travel for a few gigaparsecs all uh, the way to Earth. And um, the sources need a certain combination of new E's, new mu's, and new tau's. Uh, and do, along the way, the uh, flavor mixing changes the number of uh, new yeast, new yeast, and new tau, so that the flavor composition, or the fraction of, of each flavor that reaches the Earth, is different from the one that was emitted. And of course, different processes will give you different flavor ratios. And of course, the flavor mixing itself depends on certain experimental parameters, three mixing angles, one delta CP phase at least. And those have uh, values that, have, that are, have a certain experimental uncertainty. So that also affects the expectation of the Earth for the flavor composition. Given a certain flavor ratio at the sources, uh, by that I mean given a certain fraction of new yeast, new yeast, and new which I'm calling here FS, we can calculate the fl flavor composition, composition at the Earth, which I'm, I'm calling here F Earth, uh, if we know how the flavor transition occurs. It, so this T is the probability of a neutrino born as uh, new beta to be detected as new alpha. And alpha and beta can be E, mu, and tau. And this is, this, we know how to calculate in the standard oscillation case, uh, but this can also receive contributions from new physics. So if we see a deviation at the flavor composition that we measure at Earth from the standard expectation, then we, and if it's a precise enough measurement, then we know that this uh, uh, means that there was some sort of new physics uh, in between that affected the flavor transitions. All right. Um, so here, the, the tool that we use the most often to represent flavor composition is, are these ternary diagrams. And um, if you haven't seen them before, and let me just give you a, one example of how to read them. 
so these diagrams assume unitarity. By that I mean uh, that each point that is inside the triangle has coordinates that have to add up to one. Uh, so for this particular plot, <clears throat> this point, uh, we want to find what is the electron flavor. We have to project this point uh, at, along the the tilt of the the, the, the tilt mark corresponding to the electron flavor, and that means that it's 30 percent. For muon flavor, is a horizontal tick mark, and so we project it horizontally, and that is 45 percent. And the remaining is a one minus the sum of electron and muon, which has to be 25 percent. So this point is 0 0.3, 0 0.44, 0 0.45, and 0.25. Um, in the following, I'll show you not only points, but also regions inside the flavor triangles. So in order to think about what new physics can do to flavor, let's think about first uh, what standard expectations are. Um, let's go back to how neutrinos are produced. So one likely neutrino production mechanism that I was uh, showing you earlier is by the production, by the interaction of protons and photons, can also be protons and protons, and uh, uh, creation of pions that then further decay into neutrinos. So if we allow the full pion decay chain to develop, so the, the pion decays and also the muon decays, then we get two muon neutrinos for each electron neutrino. And we call this a one to two to zero or one third to two thirds zero flavor ratio. And we can put, we can draw that in a, fly, in a flavor uh, triangle over here. Um, in the standard oscillation case, we know how to compute the expectation of the flavor composition at the Earth. Uh, let's just fix the flavor, mix, the mixing parameters that control the flavor transition at their best fit values. And it turns out that the one to zero flavor ratio of the source becomes a one to one to one flavor composition at the, at the Earth. That is what I said earlier, we expect there to be equal amount of new new Uh at A different starting point or different benchmark scenario is uh, where we get the neutrino coming directly from the pion decay, but because the source has a high magnetic field, this intermediate muon loses significant energy by synchrotron radiation before it can decay. So when it does decay, the new mu bar and the new E that it creates are have lower energy than the neutrino created directly in the pion decay. So that the only neutrinos that contribute at the highest energies are the neutrinos and the new mu's uh, created directly from the pion decay. So we start from a zero one zero composition. And again, uh, the standard uh, oscillation scenario with the best fit mixing parameters gives you something over here at the Earth fairly close to the one 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 expectation. And a third benchmark scenario, which is less likely, is neutrino production by uh, beta decay of neutrons, which would only give new E bars to start with. So that's a one to zero zero uh, composition at the sources. And that uh, ends up over here in the green triangle. At Earth. So, so far, we've, uh, I'm showing you these uh, expectations with the mixing parameters fit at their, fixed at their best fit values. But of course, these are experimentally measured quantities, so they come with uncertainties, and we account for that. We let them vary within three sigma, then those points become regions. Um, and not only that, but the, the three scenarios that I'm showing here are just benchmarks. We don't know exactly how neutrinos are made in the sources, they can be a combination of them. They can evolve with energy, uh, and we might not be able to, to uh, distinguish the, the energy evolution, so they might all be mixed up by the time that uh, we measure them. And that means that we need to also account for different possibilities that are intermediate between the full pion decay chain, the muon damp case, and the neutron decay. When we do that, and we, uh, on top of that, when we allow the three sigma variation of the oscillation parameters, then we end up with this bow tie looking like region, where, which is uh, the allowed region for all uh, standard or all flavor compositions that are reachable by means of standard oscillation only. Um, so all the white space around that region is reachable only by new physics. That means if we, that if we make a precise enough measurement of the flavor composition that falls outside the bow tie, then uh, that is a, a good indication of there being new physics that affects the flavor transitions. Okay, so earlier I said that ice cube can measure flavor, but it's difficult. And the current status, at least officially, uh, is this one. Um, the best fit point is at 50% mu e, 50% mu mu, and no new tau content. This is the X on the right hand axis. There's now indications of there being a new tau in the flux, which moves the best fit points towards the center, but 
they've only been showing that as preliminary results so far. Uh, and around it, uh, I, I'm showing the 68 and 95 percent confidence levels, um, and you see that these are pretty broad, and that uh, goes back to the fact that we need to distinguish uh, three flavors using only two event topologies, showers and tracks, and showers maybe made either by new yeast and new, or new tiles, so it's difficult to measure flavor. Um, so far then, um, the measurement is compatible with there being, uh, with the standard source compositions. So you see that even at one sigma, uh, this region corresponding to the one to one to one standard expectation from the full pi and decay chain falls within that, uh, that confidence interval. And that is also true for the uh, composition starting from zero, one, zero. This one over here coming from neutron decay is already disfavored at the more or less two sigma level. Um, all right, so this is the standard model. This is the standard oscillation region. And as I said, everything outside that means new physics. Um, one way to, to classify the new physics in this case is, is uh, the following. So first let's recognize that this is about 15% of the whole triangle only. That means that we, we have a sizable fraction of the triangle that is reachable only with new physics. And uh, this is in, in lighter blue, the type of the flavor combinations that are that we can um, access by means of neutrino decay-like physics. And by that, I mean physics that favors uh, the survival of only one of the neutrino mass eigenstates, for instance, or, a, or some combination of them um, as a result of the high, heavier neutrino eigenstates decaying in the lightest one. I won't have time to talk in detail about this, uh, but uh, what I want to say is that neutrino decay only uh, still allows to access about 30% of the parameter space. The remaining 70% or so of the, of the triangle is reachable with a different kind of new physics, um, which is uh, like Lorentz invariance violation. I'll say more about this in a moment. Uh, but there's a large host of possibilities of how to reach, uh, of how to uh, build new physics models that allows us to reach the full parameter uh, space of flavor combinations. So this is this is where the weird stuff come in, comes in, uh, where you start questioning fundamental symmetries. So um, some of the of the uh, usual models considered that allow us to reach the full triangle include uh, things that can be modeled like high energy effective field theories, and include violation of Lorentz and CPD invariance, and a violation of equivalence principle, uh, coupling to the gravitational torsion field, uh, RG running of the mixing parameters, and in general, any form of non-unitary neutrino propagation. Uh, active star neutrino mixing also will allow us to reach into the lighter blue region uh, and any kind of flavor violating new physics like new neutrino electron interactions or, or secret neutrino interactions themselves can do the same. So I'm not going to have time to go through it, uh, all of these, but I want to show you the, the general framework of how to build a high energy effective field theory that can reach the full flavor triangle. Um, and um, let me get a bit technical for a moment. Um, so the standard oscillation Hamiltonian that controls the flavor, the flavor change uh, of neutrinos as they propagate is what I'm calling here H standard. It has a one over E dependence, has a diagonal matrix oh, that has eigenstates equal to the uh, uh, squared mass differences, delta M, delta M to one squared and delta M to one squared that are measured experimentally in isolation experiments. And um, this is written in the mass basis. It gets rotated to flavor basis by means of a three times three uh, rotation matrix, the uh, PMNS mixing matrix, uh, parameterized in terms of three mixing angles and one delta CT phase, which are also measured. Um, so in order to introduce new physics effects, we can make a copy of this standard Hamiltonian, but allow it to have a different energy dependence, e to the power of n, and this is a series over n, so there's multiple contributions, and it's suppressed by some high energy uh, energy scale. Uh, the structure is the same, we have a diagonal matrix, uh, but now the entries are known. They might have some limits, for instance, coming from atmospheric neutrinos, uh, but they're, they're very weak limits. And the rotation matrices have entries that are essentially unknown. So they have uh, mixing angles and, and, and faces whose values have not been measured. Uh, so we may vary these values uh, of, of the mixing parameters and set these to uh, saturate the current bounds in my Feigen states. And uh, see that, for instance, if we start from the zero one zero case, remember earlier we explored how this works in the standard case, you would go from here somewhere close to here. Now, if we allow the mixing parameters of the new physics Hamiltonian contribution to vary widely, 
you may end up in the same place as the standard case, so close to the center, but you may also end up anywhere else in this upper triangle uh, in red. You may also even stay over here um, uh, close to where you started from at the source. So you may kill oscillations uh, altogether. Similar, there's similar conclusions starting from anywhere in the any of the of the two corners or from the standard um, uh, oscillation, uh, sorry, the standard uh, full pion decay uh, production scenario. So this is how you get to anywhere in the triangle. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, I won't have time to talk about neutrino decay, uh, but I want to show you one slide uh, before the end um, to get you excited about the future. Um, and that is that uh, there's, I think, an exciting decade ahead. So, so far we've been talking about high energy neutrinos, those are neutrinos between TeV and a few TeV. Those are the ones that IceCube has seen so far. And they already allow us to test very small couplings uh, for a large uh, range of parameter of um, new physics models. Um, IceCube and we have Antares, which is equivalent, uh, smaller, detector in the Mediterranean and Baikal in Russia. We will have growing statistics and we're constantly improving systematics and, and, and detection, detection uh, uncertainties. But in the next decade, uh, there is a chance that we detect energies uh, of, uh, of several orders of magnitude higher energies. So the ultra high energy neutrinos predicted about 50 years ago that come from the ultra high energy cosmic ray interactions with the CMB photons. And by detecting them with EEB energies, uh, we would reach uh, couplings that are three times uh, three orders of magnitude smaller or so. Uh, however, the flux of these neutrinos is small and we will need more de uh, bigger detectors and possibly different detection techniques. Uh, fortunately, there is a large variety of experiments that are either planned or, or uh, in construction or at least envisioned. And that's, that includes uh, uh, bigger versions of IceCube, bigger versions of Antares, and of Michael, but also experiments that use other techniques, not optical detection, but radio detection um, in the eyes or in the atmosphere. Uh, and even, uh, like it's poema, even uh, satellite detection of the fluorescent signal that these neutrinos will leave in the atmosphere. All right, so the future is bright. Um, now let me, let me just finish. Uh, I, I hope I convinced you that cosmic neutrinos are incisive probes of, of neutrino physics in the PV, PV scale. Uh, that we can already do this today, in spite of uh, unknowns uh, coming from uh, mostly astrophysics. Uh, but because new physics comes in many shapes, remember it can affect any number of observables in different ways, we need to be thorough. Uh, and uh, remember that that's why the spider plot is there for, to remind us to be thorough. Uh, but the prospects for the coming decade are exciting. We not only have larger statistics and better reconstruction, but we have the chance to reach even higher energies and detect the absolute higher, highest energy neutrinos that we've been able to dream of so far. So um, I just uh, point you to these different, to these three references if you want more information about uh, these topics, and uh, I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Okay, I have a question. Sure. Uh, is there no experiment that can uh, distinguish a neutrino and an antineutrino? Uh, you mean at these energies? Or, or, or in general? I'm, I'm, in, general I'm thinking, in general. Oh, in general. Uh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, uh, well, not really, of course. Uh, it is very difficult. Uh, there are some experiments, proposed experiments to detect um, uh, the, the uh, differentiating neutrinos and antineutrinos using a, um, what's it called, um, magnetized iron calorimeter. Uh, so you would have the, the, the final state uh, charge leptons would go left or would go right depending on the charge and that would let you know what the neutrino 
identity was, whether I was a neutrino or anti-neutrino. Uh, but those have not been built. As far as I know, there's only one, yeah, that uh, there is in planning, that's Eno. Um, but I think mostly because experiments uh, work under the, uh, under the assumption of a well-known flux where you know what the, uh, what the, the dominant, uh, if, if neutrinos are dominant or uh, the neutrinos are dominant, they don't, they account for contamination of the other, of the opposite neutrino uh, that they're looking for, but they don't measure them in a event by event basis. They just do it statistically. Okay, thank you. Yep. Orlando, please just unmute yourself. Hi, uh, I want to make a question about this thing of the city interactions of the neutrinos. Yeah. Uh, uh, because uh, this, uh, if you have the assumption, for example, that the, this cross section to say of this interaction of this lighter scale is very big, this cannot change the the thin propagation inside of the Earth. Uh, if they're big enough, they they could. In fact, uh, let me just go a bit further. Uh, you you probably know this already, but if, if the interactions are significant, they will affect any. Um, uh, like a, a, any uh, instance where the neutrino density is high enough, in particular uh, supernovae, right? Um, but remember, these are neutrino-neutrino interactions, so there is a not neutrino nuclear interaction. So in order for you to get neutrino, neutrino interactions to be important inside the Earth, uh, you would need a large density of neutrinos, and I don't see how you could get that in the Earth. So maybe you're talking about a neutrino nuclear interactions that are changed by new physics. And in that case, for sure, you can use the Earth to test that. People mm -hmm. have done that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi, Peter here. Um, uh, Pe oh, um, Pedro has a question. Uh, uh, do we expect an energy dependence on neutrino flavor composition in non-standard models? Uh, yes, we, we actually expect it even in, in standard models. So, uh, you mean in the flavor composition, right? Yeah, energy yeah. dependence of neutrino yeah. flavor. Yeah. So let me, I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling to find the right thing that I want to show you. Okay, here it is. Uh, so, um, at the lower energies, and by that I mean up to 100 TeV or maybe a few hundred TeV, you expect neutrinos to be made by the full pion decay chain. So you expect it to have uh, two mu neutrinos per each electron neutrino made. But if these are indeed sources of, of neutrinos, then they have, they necessarily need a high magnetic field. Uh, and by that I mean that at higher energies, above one TeV maybe, then the synchrotron radiation on these magnetic fields of the intermediate neutrinos becomes important. And then you change the production from one to zero to zero, one, zero. So you go from here uh, to here. So you see mm -hmm. a transition in energy. And that, that doesn't have any new physics, that's just production uh, mechanisms and synchrotron radiation. Um, on top of that, uh, you might have an energy dependence on the flavor composition. Um, and, and uh, it depends on the model. For instance, neutrino, let me see if I have one here. I do. Let me show you one example. Um, I believe uh, in, uh, actually, that's no, not what I want to show you. This one, okay. So in this case, what we're showing in the, let's focus on the left hand side plot. This is the flavor ratio at Earth as a function of neutrino energy in a model where neutrinos are allowed to, to decay. Uh, I, I believe in this case, uh, new twos and new threes are allowed to decay into new ones. And as a result, the flavor composition changes. Um, so uh, you have a transition at some energy of about uh, 10 to the 5.5 in this particular case, GeV. Uh, you see a, a certain spectral swap due to the neutrino decay. So you can have neutrino model, uh, new physics models where the flavor composition changes as a function of energy, for sure.
And I think Peter had a question. Yeah, Peter, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, uh, I was curious about the uh, secret interaction stuff on 24 and 25. Yeah. Um, you know, this okay. dip is very sharp. Um, uh, yes. Uh, just a second. Uh, ah, sorry. That's not really good. So the slides 24 and 25. Okay, there we go. Uh, 24 is this one, yeah. Yeah, uh, in, any of these ones. Yeah. Um, well, my, okay, maybe, yes, the, the ones with all the dips, yeah. Yeah. Um, they're, they're very pointy, and I guess I'm wondering, do you, I mean, uh, th there's some features that I would think would smear this out, and maybe you include them, and they don't actually do anything. So things like the temperature distribution of the cosmic neutrino background, right? It's not all the, those neutrinos don't have one distribution. It's a fairly broad distribution. Yeah. And then also that temperature distribution evolves with redshift, and you have sources coming from a range of redshifts, and they integrate through the whole redshift. And mm -hmm. so I would think that would smear these dips out. You're, you're right. Uh, so we do account for the red distribution. And in spite of that, there is a, the features are fairly sharp. Uh, but the, there's, uh, there's two things that are making these features probably sharper than they are. And the first one is, as you say, we assume that neutrinos uh, of their cosmic neutrino background all have the same energy. In reality, it's a black body spectrum with a peak at of the temperature of 0.1 uh, electron volts. Uh, I should say the most likely energy is 0.1 electron volts. Um, that in, that uh, makes the features sharper than they should be. And uh, the second thing is um, we assume that um, all the neutrino mass eigenstates have the same mass in a way. Uh, and that is a simplifying assumption, but when you lift that, then you don't get just one dip, but you get a dip at each value of the neutrino mass eigenstate. Uh, by that, I mean that, for instance, next to the green dip, you would see very close to it, uh, a couple more, maybe three dips, each one for each new one, new two, and new three, because they have slightly diff different resonance energies. And uh, that ice cube would look, uh, would smear this even farther. But that also means that the dips aren't as deep then. Sorry? That, that means that each individual dip isn't as deep. So it's effectively smearing, yes. smearing it yes. out. Yes, yeah, for sure, but, for sure. So, so there's, there's a recent paper by, uh, by Kamenkowski where they actually explored that. Uh, and, and yeah, for sure this, this should be there in a, in a more general analysis, yeah. And so, so I guess sort of related to that, I mean, you know, given that this should be more smeared out, I guess my question is, you know, you guys and others have placed constraints on, you know, uh, neutrino neutrino interactions. How can you actually know that you can place a constraint on it? That is, you assume that the sources are single power law, and in light of the fact that, you know, there's good reason to believe that that may not be the case, one could easily imagine you have one source ending and the next source starting, and that that looks pretty much the same as this. So how can you ever constrain or detect anything? I skew with you. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, you have to assume something for the flux. You have to assume something for the the shape of the emitted neutrino spectrum. Uh, and fortunately, uh, we haven't done an analysis with, where we vary that beyond using a power law with a varying spectral index. Uh, what would be interesting to do uh, is to subject this kind of analysis to also a variation in the initial flavor, uh, sorry, the initial shape of the spectrum that is emitted by the sources. So maybe also accounting for not one population of sources across the full energy range, but two populations, one at lower energies and one at higher energies. Uh, that in itself might explain a dip. The dip might be occurring as a result of one population dying, uh, dying out and the other starting to take over. Uh, that is a perfectly possible explanation, uh, but um, under the assumption that that is not the case, that there's just one population of sources uh, and assuming that there is no, uh, that the emission is like a power law, you can place this kind of, uh, of constraints. Uh, it, is, it is possible that the, that the sources are not emitting as a power law, uh, especially not across a, a large uh, range of energies. So it would be interesting to do this kind of experiment, 
maybe using a bin spectrum that and 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 treating each bin in energy uh, more or less separately from the other, so that uh, you minimize the effect of the shape of the spectrum. Okay, um, uh, we have a question from Mariano. Uh, from Mariano Chavez. Uh, should I read it or does Mariano want to say it? He put it in chat. So I suppose I can read it. Um, I can read it. Okay. So if the earth is opaque, I suppose the moon and the sun are also. Is it possible in the future to measure some suppression of high energy neutrinos coming from the sun and the moon? Is it um, possible? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, is that, is that it? It's a question, yeah. Okay. I yeah. mean, neutrinos that come from ultra physical sources and also travel through the moon and the sun before they arrive on Earth. That that's correct, uh, but that is also true that they should be stopped by them. Uh, but again, the, the the well, there's there's two effects here. Uh, the first one is that you need a very good angular resolution to actually um, distinguish the moon from the everything else. Um, um, we don't quite have that. Maybe we are at the level where we're starting to have that. Neon tracks has a sub-degree resolution. The moon is about uh, a degree uh, in the sky. So in principle, you could do that. Uh, but again, the statistics are so low uh, that it is unlikely that you, you can do that. Uh, the moon is um, uh, probably too small too small a target to try to do that, and the same for the for the sun. Uh, too far away, the solid angle is too small. Further questions? If not, thank you very very much. Thank you. Um, obrigado para todos para atender.